the big story. Hey, Stanley. Stanley, just a second. How about a statement before they lock you up? Okay. I'll tell you the whole truth, but you won't print it. I'm guilty. I'm guilty because I'm nobody. I'm guilty because somebody wanted to get somewhere, and in order to get there, he put his feet right in my face, stepped on me, sent me up for life to get where he wants to get. I'd like to see you print that. Freedom of the press. Detroit, Michigan. From the pages of the Detroit Free Press comes the story of a frame-up so cold, so calculating, so perfect, that it took 26 years to explode it. Detroit, Michigan. The story as it actually happened. Ralph Dahl's story as he lived it. It's a dream writing assignment, Ralph Gall of the Detroit Free Press. A six-month job of digging into the unsolved crimes of Michigan, and you've written a dozen views. The riddle of the blue icicle. That one called a special coroner's interest into being. The case of the severed hand. This one brought a well-deserved promotion to a cop on the beach. And the others, all good, honest stories. And with the public clamoring for more, you kept digging in. And then, out of the morgue, came the yellow pages of a case 25 years old. Three things hit you. First, the name. The case of the picnic murder. Second, the byline. By Teddy Larkin. Teddy Larkin, now dead, died at 31, was one of the best reporters on the paper. And an old friend. One of the very best. His byline on a story meant something. True. And three, the third thing that hit you was fact. A 4th of July picnic celebration 25 years ago in Sylvan Gardens, just outside Detroit. Cheese, cheese, cheese. Is that all you made, Edna? Cheese? Oh, I thought Willie was coming. You know how he is about cheese. They had to work. You think one holiday in the year they take time off from that filling station. What are you complaining about? You know why they're working. <laughs> sure, I know. I honestly wouldn't mind waiting the extra month to get married. They just see us once on a Sunday or a holiday. There's a tuna fish and a deviled egg. Did you bring the pickles? What do you think this is? What's a picnic and no pickles? <laughs> <laughs> Edna! What's the matter, Edna! <laughs> no! The first girl, B, was dead instantly. The second girl, Edna... A terrible pain in the shoulder. A bullet embedded. And a memory that'll live with her forever. He was big and dirty. He had some kind of a bag over his shoulder. And he came up to me. Close and close. And then he took out the cotton. It smelled funny. Like chloroform or something. And then... I don't remember. I don't remember. A posse of over 500 men combed the area of Sylvan Gardens, combed the downtown flop houses, looking for a man six feet tall, dark, dirty, with a shoulder bag, gun, and maybe still the traces of the cotton and the chloroform he'd used. There was one suspect, Tony Stanley. Tom Vinton, local policeman, picked him up. What do you mean, what was I doing? I told you what I was doing, officer. They were pouring drinks, free drinks, all along Michigan Avenue, Fourth of July celebration. I was lapping them up as fast as I could. But what's the matter? There's no crime. Let's go, Stanley. I don't want to hear any more. You can ask any one of the bartenders, officer. I was in 8, 10, 12 joints. Ask him. Oh, they wouldn't remember. You got mud on your shoes, mud from Sylvan Gardens, where you were tramping around before you did it. And you got blood on your lapel. How'd you get blood on your lapel? I came out of one of the bars the back way into the yard there. I, was, I, I didn't know where I was going. It was dark and muddy, and I, I fell. There was a can there, an old sardine can. I, I fell on it. I cut myself. Maybe I wiped it off on my lapel. I don't know, officer. Where's the shoulder bag? 
What'd you do with the gun? And where's the chloroform? Come on, on your feet. Walk. <laughs> so you cut your finger on a sardine can, huh? Did you have iodine handy? The rest was equally bizarre. Equally fantastic, terrifying. Then the identification by the frightened girl. Get him out. Please, get him out. He's the one. He did it. Get him out. It is the judgment of the court that you, Anthony Stanley, shall spend the rest of your natural life in prison. Will you stand guilty of the crime of murder? I wish it were in my power to sentence you to further punishment. And the fourth fact about this case, the fourth unusual aspect struck you, Ralph Gall, feature writer, as you read the yellowed sheet. You said it to night editor Fred Sandler. You remember this case, Sandler? Yeah, vaguely, vaguely. Why? They never disproved this sardine can theory about the blood. Lots of things not proved in lots of cases. So? And the girl didn't testify at the trial. So they took her deposition somewhere else. They never found the shoulder bag, or the gun, or the cotton, or the chloroform. So what? So what? How old is this chestnut, anyhow? Twenty years? And more. You know who wrote it? Ted Larkin. So? Who filed this story where it's filed now? What are you talking about? I mean, what's an open and shut murder case doing in the file of unsolved crimes? Who put it there? Was it misfiled or was it? And if you read this story, he never put it down in so many words, but in every line, in every sentence almost, Ted Larkin implied, watch out, frame up. Well, maybe he'd been on this stuff too long. Not Larkin. He was quite a guy, you know that. He wouldn't imply frame up unless he meant frame up. Do you remember what Larkin used to say about the guys in stir? Used to quote a piece of poetry, Walt Whitman, remember? I am one with these convicts and felons. What about that? <laughs> Maybe it's good poetry, Ralphie, but it don't make a story. And if I prove that oh, it if, does... Oh, if, 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 you print a paper with this. Knock off for a week, will you? Take the political side, lay off features. When you guys get to quoting poetry, brother. You drop it because orders are orders. But all that week, it gnaws at you. Ted Larkin's quote of Whitman. And then... Dear Ralph Gall, I've been reading your series about unsolved crimes, and I only got one question to ask. Would you laugh if a fellow said, 25 years ago, I was framed? If you would, tear this up. Don't read no more. But if you're a decent guy like Ted Larkin was... He once worked on your paper, interviewed me. Then I got something to say. My name is Tony Stanley. Just one of those things that happen. One of the fantastic coincidences that make up life. Well, Sandler? Oh, go ahead if you want to. Go ahead, I don't care. All I want to do is go up and see the guy at Marquette. I told you to go ahead. I am one with the convicts and felons. First, I thought I'd grow azaleas, hyacinths, maybe some of them little zinnias, but nothing grows up here. <laughs> nothing. Bad soil. I'd like to talk about your letter, Mr. Stanley. Sometimes morning glories grow, some six, seven feet high. You like them? Yeah, yeah, they're nice. Mr. Carl, when a guy gets somebody to believe in him just a little bit, he don't want it to be over with right away. I had this experience ten times, maybe. Somebody gets a little bit interested. You, <laughs> you learn not to talk about it all at once, because it'll bust right out of you and disappear, maybe, if you do it. Do you understand? Sure. Yeah. Who cares about a broken-down bum on Skid Row? Who cares about the shoulder bag or the cotton or the gun or sardine cans? I'll tell you who cares. Former chief of detectives Tom Benton cares. He cares a lot. He's the one who sent me up, framed, used my face to get where he was going. Do you know that scum? You remember the name of Tom Benton? 
You remember the cop on the beat, Tom Benton? You remember he got a conviction to stand the case. You remember he got another. Sergeant Benton by now. And another and another. Skid Row bums, nameless people. He became lieutenant of detectives. The big roundup of Michigan Avenue dives, and then chief of detectives, Thomas J. Linton. Then. Linton got sent up for framing two guys. Caught at it, right? That scum. He's right in this jail now. He was behind it. He did the whole thing. Is that it, Vinton? The only thing I ever smile about now, the only thing, is that I know where that scum is. He's sitting in there, across the yard, see? Right in there. Solitary. For the rest of his natural life. Five minutes. Don't get too close to him. Thanks. Vinton. I told him no visitor to. Who's that? Get out, leave him alone. Don't come near me. I'm Ralph Gall of the Free Press, reporter. I said I don't want to see nobody. I never want to see nobody. Leave me alone. Don't come near me. I'm not going to touch you. I wouldn't touch you. You don't know. Nobody knows. I think because you're in solitary, because you've got bars in the cell, you think you're safe, huh? Well, look at this, my neck. Got me with a spoon, one of the trustees. You think you're safe? Still, they get you. They'll kill me. They'll kill me, I know it. I pleaded with the warden. I, I got down on my knees. I, I told him, send me up somewhere. You framed a lot of guys, didn't you, Benton? You got to be chief stepping on a lot of people's faces, didn't you? What about Tony Stanley? What about the Sylvan Gardens killing? <laughs> that's all I need to talk. To say it, that's all I need. Then it would get around that I said it. That I framed the guy. That I said I did it just once. And you know what they do? They'd move in on me. They'd squeeze me. What they did before would be like nothing if they heard I told in just one case. But then they'd make me tell them all. Just get out of here. But in the horror, in the incredible foulness of a completely corrupt human being, one simple fact emerges. Tony Stanley was framed 25 years ago. And you feel the phrase of Walt Whitman as never before. I am one with the convicts and felons. Now prove it, Gall. Prove you mean it. Cy Harris, returning it to your narrator, and the big story of Ralph Gall, as he lived it and wrote it. You, Ralph Gall, feature writer for the Detroit Free Press, ponder the biggest question you've had in your reporter's life. How to reopen a case 25 years dead. You begin at Detroit Police Headquarters. The mugging shots, routine pictures taken. The history of the criminal... The psychologist's report, all yellowed fray, all very unsubstantial bits of paper. Hey, Sarge, look at this. No previous arrest, no previous record. Not even a minor narcotics rap, nothing. Look, one of the nicest murderers I ever met never made a single wrong move, not even one, until the day he blew up his family, killed his wife and six kids. Oh, you're informed today. Here's what I don't get. No bag was ever found. No gun. The girl testified the murderer was six feet tall. Stanley's no better than 5'6", maybe 5'7". And listen to this part of the psychologist's report. Criminal tendencies dubious. It adds up. Psychologist. Brother, you go on up to Marquette someday. Give some of them intelligence tests and stuff to the guys in cell block T. They'll knock over most of them professors any time. Don't tell me you believe that stuff. 
Where do you go to find corroboration on a 25-year-old crime? Where? Skid Row, the Michigan Avenue dives? Who would remember? Well, maybe somebody would. The old guy who's been selling papers for 37 years at the corner. He remembers. Uh, Stanley? <laughs> Ain't he the guy who went over to Africa, found that other guy? Remember Mr. Stanley, Dr. Livingston? What'd he do now? Get himself lost? The mission of the friendly heart. As old as Detroit's waterfront, almost. With characters that go at the place. And there for decades. But the organist doesn't remember. And the guy who collapses the plate around doesn't remember. And the man who stands up and speaks of the brotherhood of derelicts. But one does. Incredibly, one does. One who steps off from the platform, gets his bowl of soup, and talks. Yeah. Yeah, him and me like the same thing. Flowers. Saddest little guy in the whole world. Framed, neat, like a picture. Framed, strung up on a wall. Saddest little guy in the world. How do I know? I know. Prove it? <laughs> Prove that a dead guy is dead. He's dead, that's all. Nothing in a series of nothings. Nothing and nothing compounded. In Pontiac nearby, where the trial was held, because Sylvan Gardens is in Rockland County, you get the compounding of nothing. Just a minute, young man. One question at a time. The judge, well, he died 11 years ago. Heart attack. The prosecuting attorney, that was Botwin. He was a major in the infantry, died at Bottle Canal. What about the jurors? Jurors? <laughs> you can search all over America, spend the next 50 years. You might find one, I doubt that. But miraculously, in only six months, you actually find one. Juror number seven. You say I served? Well, maybe I saved. Guess it did so long ago. Uh, Stanley, it's funny. You can't remember a thing. You send a man up for the rest of his life, you can't remember a thing. Oh, oh, wasn't there a sheriff? There was something about a sheriff. Something. Don't remember what. Sheriff is my father. I don't mind speaking of it. He said I was there at the time he died. He said Tony Stanley never had a chance. Your father, I mean... He... I don't mind if you say it. He took his own life. I think he did it because of what he was made to do about Tony Stanley. He said just before he died, that poor little guy never had a chance. Frame from the word go. Tom Vinton's work. Now the blood begins pounding within you. The first real basis for a reversal... Something tangible, not slipping through your fingers. A deposition from the daughter of the sheriff who killed himself because of the Stanley case. Get the proceedings. Get the transcripts. You get them, and it's worse. It's worse than if you'd found nothing. Because... What do you mean they've never been transcribed? They must have been transcribed sometime, somewhere. Look, mister, that's all I know. Those notes in the handwriting the court sent they never were transcribed, and that system he used was his own private system. What? There ain't a soul alive that I ever heard of to make sense of them. Well, that's impossible. A Steno's notes can be read. Well, you try it, mister. Six other people tried it. You know how far they got? I have studied the notes, Mr. Gall, and they can be transcribed. The task will take roughly uh, six months. The cost? Well, there would uh, $1,500 be too much? Are you kidding? Short of that, I couldn't help you. Well, is there anything in there? Can you tell me anything about the hearings at all? Well, I, I spent the time on one section, that dealing with the witness, Edna Purcell. And on the basis of my difficulty with this section, I made my estimate. There is, incidentally, a bill of $50. Can you give me her address at least? Yes, of course. You'll handle the bill? One slim hope. A girl. Edna Purcell is her name. Is it still the same? Is she still in Detroit? Will she remember? Where can you find her? 
You've got this far, so you keep going. And in the city directory for 1929, you learn... Edna Purcell married Henry Stamper, June 7th, uh, 1262 Euclid Avenue. You want to repeat that, please, Mr. Gall? I just want to know, Mrs. Stamper, if you can remember anything at all about an incident 26 years ago, the 4th of July. Mr. Gall, I started teaching school about, oh, 20 years ago. And one of the teachers at the school was very kind to me. He was a slightly older man, very understanding. Mr. Stamper, we went around together seven years before he asked me to marry him. I never told him anything. I can't. I never talked about it to anyone. And then Ellen was born. She's getting out of college this month. And Jimmy and Donna. I got my children, my husband, this house. I do the usual things that a woman does. And I paint a little. What did you want me to say? What do you want, Mr. Gall? You're here, Ralph Gall. It's the moment and the place. But you don't ask. You don't pursue the line you've been pursuing for over a year. Mm. Why? Because here is the girl herself. Now a woman. The horror is behind her. A life has been built, a structure, a family. Mm. Can you upset all this by bringing up the past now? You must ask yourself, whether the innocence of one man is more urgent than the lives of five people. It's okay, Mrs. Stamper. It's not important. Not that important. Mr. Gall, who's important? Which one of us? Which one of us is or isn't? Oh, don't think I don't appreciate that you didn't ask me. But I want to talk. All these years I've wondered... Did I lend myself in a moment of hysteria to the frame-up of an innocent man? Did I identify the wrong man? And I think now I did. If you'll just let me get my coat and leave a note for Mr. Stamper, I'll be right with you. We read you that telegram from Ralph Gall of the Detroit Free Press. Cooperation of Edna plus my series of big stories and the recommendation of Circuit Bench of Rockland County all led the governor of Michigan to issue a commutation of Stanley's sentence. Stanley is a useful citizen today, earning decent living in large factory in Detroit. Tom Vinton, although never directly connected with crime of framing Stanley, will surely die a prisoner in Marquette Prison. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.